Good morning. Today we're going to take one last look at apologetics and the way we're going to look at it is based on modern culture and how it looks at Jesus. We're going to talk about today cancel culture and it's all the rage right now. Tensions are high and tolerance is low and so everybody gets the blame somewhere. The phrase cancel culture refers to the wiping out of support for people, mainly public figures. If you see on Twitter or any of the other social medias out there, you may hear something where somebody has been canceled. But what it is is when somebody says or does something that popular culture sees as disagreeable. Now, we've seen it in recent years, people such as Mel Gibson or Lori Laughlin, Lance Armstrong, Jimmy Fallon, uh, Michael Jackson, and Roseanne Barr, just to name a few of those folks. Politicians in particular, they are ones that are looked at today and are canceled. Uh, the president in particular is noted for canceling people and being canceled himself. And everybody from left and right are into going and trying to cancel the other out through their actions. And even a high school student from Covington, Kentucky was canceled by the media in a representation that was not legitimate. They saw him as someone that was laughing and mocking an individual who was of uh, a Native American descent. The problem was that the Native American was in fact the one causing the problem. He was the one that started it, and later the video evidence proved that. And so the boy was actually given quite a lot of money uh, as far as when they settled out of court because the papers didn't want to get sued. They didn't want to have to go in their own words and in their own works or on their own TV shows and go and say, well, we screwed up, we were wrong. These days, everybody, in anybody, whether they're politicians and preachers, actors or athletes, comedians or commentators, artists or activists, whatever they are, are being socially canceled based on the wrong tweet or the wrong tone, the wrong message, the wrong opinion, the wrong word, wrong whatever. In some cases, dirt from over 20 years ago or in some cases, a president's 200 years ago are being dug up and revealed for the world to see and for them to judge. If you have ever messed up in some kind of public way in your life, then you may have a shot of being canceled. And that's not something you want. So with a techie term like that, surely this has all got to be something new, right? The cancel culture, that kind of idea, that's got to be brand new. <laughs> Actually, no. I want us to look at one particular verse today. I want us to turn into our Bibles to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. We're going to look at verses 1 through 9 today. Acts chapter 17, 1 through 9. And after we get done with that, we will be continuing on into a little part of uh, Acts chapter 17. But I want us to really focus in on this first part of this because it is so imperative for us to understand that in the early days of the church there was popular culture there too it was all around and it turned out that popular culture popular culture turned against those that were saying what they felt like was the wrong thing let's look at what acts 17 says start at verse 1 now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, not to mention a few of the leading ladies. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men from the rabble, they formed a mob, 
set the city in an uproar, attack the house of Jason, seeking to bring him out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they drove Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Isn't it interesting that cancel culture shows itself even in the first century? You see, cancel culture is rooted in the postmodern assumption that all truth, all truth is individual and subjective. Each of us interprets our experiences of the world in a way that is unique to us. And as a result, we are told that there can be no such thing as objective or absolute truth. Now, conventional wisdom, therefore, is going to claim that only your truth and my truth are there. Of course, the denying absolute truth is to state an absolute truth. You know, you ever heard that? Somebody says there is no such thing as absolute truth. Well, when they say there's no such thing as absolute truth, they're making an absolute statement, thus saying what they believe to be a absolute truth. As Ravi Zacharias noted, with no fact as a referent, what is normative is purely a matter of preference. Better said, truth is preferential. It's what you see it as. It becomes what you accept it as. When we go to that direction, there's no such thing as legitimate truth. And there is danger in that. Because God shows us that there implicably and implicitly is absolute truth. Tolerance is therefore a great value of our society. We are told that we must tolerate and affirm any behavior that does not harm another. However, our tolerant culture is very highly tolerant of anyone it perceives as intolerant. So cancel culture is just the latest expression of this contradiction. This contradictory idea that, well, there is absolutely no absolutes. When people don't like the truth, many times they won't study or won't look deep or won't research it. They go on to believe the truth that they are told or what they think is truth because of their experience. Well, there is no God. How do you know there is no God? There's no proof. There's proof all around you. Look at the mountains, look at the hills, look at the trees, look at the sunset, look at the sunrise. There's proof everywhere God exists. There's also proof that God's word is in existence as well. And we've talked about that as well. Either the apostles in the New Testament were preaching the truth or they were preaching a lie. What's more reasonable to believe? That they actually saw Jesus and saw him resurrect from the dead? Or that all of them had some kind of mass delusion and thought that Jesus was alive? See, it all comes down to what we think and how we perceive it, right? Not necessarily. It is all a matter of truth. What is truth? Truth is what can be proven by the evidence that is presented. And absolute truth is true absolutely. And thus we go and we say that Jesus is absolutely proven to be Lord and Savior. Paul does that several times in the book of Acts chapter 17. There's a problem, though, here with what's going on in the synagogue. You see, the people in the synagogue believed in the truth of God. They believed. They didn't have to study any further. They accepted God as true. But here come Paul, and he was handpicked by the Lord to teach those same Jewish people that while those that were knowing the teachings of Abraham, Moses, and the prophets were once God's chosen, now the Gentiles, who never knew God, we're going to be invited in and be part of the family. And it is through Jesus Christ that this takes place. Their reaction looks very reminiscent to some nasty Twitter comment 
or Twitter thread that is out there. If you go on to Twitter or you go on to Facebook and you see someone that posts something that is controversial, let's say, people are arguing left and right, trying to defend their position over the truth. It may not be something that is truth. If the person is stating truth, then there's all sorts of people that are getting involved in it and getting upset because it may mess with their view of truth. Let's look and see what Paul says happened here. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men from the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they're acting against the decree of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. Here we're seeing them actually talking viciously and taking action. They're grabbing Paul's friends by the back of their necks and basically dragging them out to the crowd to have judgment on them. These men who have turned the world upside down, you see, that's what Jesus does when people are offended by him or, uh, or whether he goes against what they believe in or how they view the world around them. You see, Jesus is countercultural, And that's what Christians should be. We shouldn't be embracing popular culture. Jesus sure didn't. In fact, if Jesus did anything, he stood counter to the culture. The leaders were looked at as liars and serpents, and the people who were the most vulnerable were the ones Jesus looked to and tried to encourage, help, and inspire. That's how we should be. We should be people who are seeking to build, strengthen, and encourage one another. We should be going and being countercultural. Today, we've seen so many people that have been canceled. Most of them are popular. Most of them are big names. But have you ever been canceled? Have you yourself gone through that pain where somebody has unfriended you on Facebook maybe because of uh, a political difference? Or maybe you were on Instagram and you shared a picture and somebody said, boy, that just isn't right. You shouldn't be showing that. You shouldn't be sharing that. And then all your friends gang up on you. Or maybe, just maybe, you said something about Jesus and somebody looked to you that didn't believe in him and said, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in those myths. I don't believe in fairy tales. And how hurtful those words are. You see, when we stand for Christ, it is often the case that people who do not believe in the absolute Christ will go and be offended. And they will want to be offended because of what Christ represents. As Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the truth and the life, no man comes to the Father but through me. That phrase, the, the is an absolute statement. He is the way, the only way. He is the truth, the only truth. He is the life, the only life that can get you to heaven. You see where people might be resistant to that. Because the means there's no wiggle room. Jesus has to be the sole means by which we come to know God. Not through Muhammad or Buddha or Confucius, any preachers or teachers, businessmen, even ourselves. We can't get to know God except through Jesus. It is through Jesus and his wonderful gospel. So what's with all the hate, right? What's with all the hate? Why would the Jews in Paul's time and the people of our time go to such extremes to silence this powerful truth? It's real simple. If we embrace the one way, we have to embrace Jesus as the sole means of who controls our life. To many, that's just a bridge too far and completely unacceptable. They are content in their lives, being filled with worldly pleasure, worldly desires, worldly ideas, and yes, subjective values. Look at what Jesus did to poor Jason and the others. It says in the scripture, it says, And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let him go. What did they do? They shook him down. Why? 
just like today, it has zero to do with truth and has everything to do with appeasement. Well, we'll make it feel better if we go and get paid for this or if, if you agree not to say so much about that. And they'll continue to shake people down, ask for apologies, or look for some kind of reparations. Why? Because they feel that these people have taken it too far. And sometimes it ain't even the people it ain't even those people that have taken it too far. It's other people that have taken it too far. These people had a cause and that cause was to go against Christ. That's what the mob had turned into. Someone against the teaching and the belief of Jesus as King and Lord of their lives. They sought to destroy him. Mark 13, 13 says, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. He isn't wrong. People, don't, who, don't, who, people who don't know you are going to hate him. If you mention Jesus in the wrong crowd, they're going to make you feel like a leper. They're going to look at you and say you're unclean. They may not like you, but they're absolutely going to hate for what you stand for. Now I want to shift back this lesson a little bit to those who are here. How many times have we canceled others? How many times have we been the people who are the ones canceling? How many times have we allowed our opinion of the past actions of others corrupt our view of leaders, of church members, of friends, neighbors, even ourselves? Are we accountable? And are we being held accountable? As we are holding one another to that level, Christ wants, we need to remember it doesn't mean that we have to pound each other into submission with angry actions and words like this mob did. Sometimes we just need a friend to pull us to the side and say, Hey, look, have you really thought about this? Have you really taken this into consideration? Have you looked past yourself and see Jesus? What would Jesus say? How would he act? How would he respond? I've had to ask that to myself quite a bit. I've had to repent of my sins numerous times where I failed him. Nobody is going to get it right 100% of the time. That's why I'm preaching this today. We need to realize that we may think we have everything right. But what happens when Jesus shows us the truth? That we need to do better. Well, it's exactly what Paul did. You see, when Paul left Thessalonica, he went and made a difference elsewhere. It says here in the verses following, it says, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they had arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, and with not a few Greek women of high standing, as well as men. Did you see that? Did you see what took place? They were told that very same thing that had been told to the others in Thessalonica. They went and their response was completely different. It wasn't to go and question and get angry. It wasn't to go and be mean. It wasn't to go and try to get something from somebody. It was to stop, review, examine, and accept. You see, they realized what they needed to do. And they changed their hearts to fit the objective truth that was presented to them. Paul held truth held excuse me Paul held them accountable to the truth the truth and they submitted to the truth both Jew and Gentile now they may have felt a lot like the Thessalonians at some point that had been revolting and angered and upset but nevertheless it stated that they were more noble and received the word 
You see, the Bereans engaged actively and received the word. We, when we welcome God's word, when we receive God's word, we allow its truth into our lives, into our very hearts, into our souls. We receive it for ourselves, not for others. Not so my kids can be saved. Not so my wife can be saved. Not so that my preacher can feel redeemed that he preached a good message. I accept the truth because I need to accept that Jesus is the truth. And I do it to benefit my soul because I need Jesus. I need Jesus. You need Jesus. Every individual on the face of this planet needs Jesus. Paul held them accountable for that truth. And yeah, they may have felt bad about it at first, but the more they examined, the more they looked at it day by day, it says, they continued to examine the truth and see if that truth was there. When we welcome the word into our hearts, when we embrace it, we receive it, we welcome it with full approval. We receive it into the inner man and make it a part of our lives. And thus, we should apply it to all people in our lives, our enemies and our friends even those that have hurt us and those that we have canceled. Do you remember what Jesus said about anger and being upset in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21? He says, You have heard it said in those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be held liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. We tend to remember people primarily by the things that they've done or the ways that they have hurt us in the past. The old saying goes like this, a moment on the lips, a lifetime in the heart. And how often we hold that anger and that an upset feeling inside of us and we often let it come out in the worst of times and to be honest that's a, from our vantage point how we respond to them we let our anger get the best of us and we look at them as fully and finally done with gone a lot like the Jews from Thessalonica did they are beyond the scope of redemption. Well, at least to us. They don't get any quarter, no clemency, no grace at all. These people who have hurt us are lost and not worth a moment more of our time. They've been canceled. In cancel culture, any failure renders a verdict, you see. And that verdict is to be banned and shunned for life. Now, our Savior, on the other hand, who is very much countercultural, will have nothing to do with that. Preacher Tully and Chavetagin says it this way Jesus called canceled people his friends. In fact, his circle of followers included a betrayer, a thief, and a prostitute, just to name a few. He was unwilling to cancel the worst of the worst the baddest of the bad and the guiltiest of the guilty. He moved toward those whom society moved away from. He befriended, loved, touched the outcast, the misfit, the leper, the liar, the sexual deviant. He refused to dismiss those who had been dismissed, reject those who had been rejected, denounce those who had been denounced, and shame those who had been shamed. Fact, his closest friends were of such ill repute that the religious leaders concluded Jesus had to be an imposter because no self-respecting man of God would embrace the kinds of people Jesus embraced. That is the Jesus whom we serve. That is the Jesus, the one who stands as the beacon of truth. The one who stands as the Savior of mankind. 
in the midst of a culture that lies, deceives, is angry and selfish. But in all of this, there is one kind of canceling that Jesus does do. Colossians 2, 13 through 14 says, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And maybe this is why Jesus himself was canceled by his culture and ours today. You see, the love toward those who are hated, his beautiful and matchless grace, is just too vulgar for a culture that holds on and clings to the idea of having peace by going and ignoring the log in their eye and paying attention to the speck in others. Have we done that? Have we as the church done that as well? Has each individual Christian had a problem with that in the past? I know I have. But Jesus doesn't have a problem with that. The problem Jesus has is when we go and we don't admit there is a problem. Jesus wants us to embrace the problem and fight it. Don't let our past define us. Don't let our sin define us. Let our lives be defined by the Savior we serve, by the name we serve, Jesus Christ. You know, I think it's something we can remember and be proud of. Jesus cancels the terrible things that we people were canceled for. The sins, scandals, and statements that cancel culture chooses not to forgive and forget. Jesus chooses not to remember it all and forgives them completely. If you love me, and you will obey my commandments. Jesus' own words. Do we love Jesus enough to follow him, to embrace him? Do we love Jesus enough to make that commitment, to be a friend of sinners, just as he is? The brother of the outcast, and to help us to remember to forgive 70 times 7. He is the Lord of our redemption, of our healing. And He can be the redeeming factor in someone else's life. Maybe we can reach out to them. Maybe Jesus is reaching out to us today. Maybe he's looking at us and saying, you need to remember and be held accountable. Take action. Don't take it from me. Take it from Jesus himself. Jesus says that if we are going to obey his commandments, we're going to show our love for him. We're going to obey his command. If we really want to get to know him, we really want to love him, the best way we can do that is love God and love others. And... Where Jesus speaks, we're going to speak. Where, we are, where he is silent, where he is allowing liberty, we need to have liberty. But moreover, that we need to allow Jesus to be our lives. To be the one that people sees. I don't want people to hear Robbie Harmon preach. I want the words of Jesus to come out in everything that's said and done. And if I am coming out, may I be cast back and said, get behind me, Satan. Because it's not about me. It's about Jesus. 
I hope you'll follow Jesus closer today. I hope you'll listen to his word. And I hope that you will look inside of yourself and say, Have I been canceled? Or am I guilty of canceling? Maybe you're canceling yourself. Maybe you've said all this time, I need peace. And I can't find it. Through Jesus we can find peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Why? Because in order to have peace, we need to have God. God is where we find peace. Through Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, we find hope and peace. This morning, I hope you will look into your life and see the need to embrace Christ, to believe, to repent, to confess, to be baptized, to walk in the newness of life, to be changed and transformed dramatically by the hand of our Savior. Maybe you want to rededicate yourself to walking with Him. You can do that too. Whatever is on your heart, whatever burden is on your mind, may it be Jesus that is seen in all things. Hey, are you interested in apologetics and examining why God's Word is historically accurate and true? Get your free copy of our ebook, Arrogant or Accurate, at www.myllbia.com today.